We had nine verses in front of us that we'll be looking at in the next few weeks. Now, and I feel bad for you because, you know, you might, I don't know, you might see this boring. You'd be going into so much detail. Maybe some of you would be thinking, well, why don't you get with it and preach one chapter a week? <laughs> well, good luck. <laughs> we'll be looking at uh, verses 1 through 9. So let's read that together just to be refreshed. <clears throat> we start with <coughs> the author of the letter, Peter. And then the position that Christ has placed him in, an apostle of Jesus Christ. To the strangers scattered through Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the knowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is according to His abundant mercy, <coughs> have begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance. I said, so look at these three words. I've been looking at the news, and I thought, you know, a lot of people have lost everything they had their hopes on, saving for many, many years hoping that maybe what they have accumulated would be enough to retire with and now it's all gone. So when I read verse 4, it becomes especially significant for me. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that faded not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold things, <coughs> that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than the gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus, whom having not seen, ye love in whom thou now ye see him not, yet believe, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of our souls. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, this is just the introduction to an amazing uh, letter. I don't think any preacher is really ready to really preach from the epistle until he's finished preaching from the epistle because it's almost at the end when you really start getting a better understanding of what it's all what's there and father so far we've been able to glean some important truths and in this section father you tell us that father son and holy spirit are involved not only in our salvation but also in our consecration in our calling in, in the work that you have chosen us to do. So, so Lord, as we move on with this section, I pray that we will find those seven wonderful truths, Lord, that we need to understand in, in order for us to feast on and, uh, and once we enjoy those things, then we won't be attracted to the things of this world. I pray that you will give me utterance, give me the ability to open up the scriptures. May your spirit be the one bringing the, these truths to our mind and, of course, to a place of practice. Be with us this afternoon. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Remember last week I opened this uh, section, verse, especially verses 3 and on. And I titled it, God's Remedy, or God's Recipe to Live for the Lord in and Resist Persecution and Temptation. A remedy, a, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's a, a combination of truths that helps us 
uh, to help so that uh, the Lord wants us to feast on, so that when this world comes and says, no, come this way, we'll say, no, I'm sorry, I am completely satisfied. Now, understanding these truths, I'm sure if Lot, if you remember the Old Testament character, Lot, if he would have understood this, I'm sure he would have made better, better choices. But we know what the world did with him and his family. And I, just to refresh your mind, we saw that um, that story, the Lot story, was a tragic story. Uh, a story of a man who ruins his life. Lot went through a process. The world courted Lot and then the world conformed him and then the world corrupted him and finally the world cost him. It cost him not only his own reputation but his his, his, his family. And I think that's a good illustration um, of the tragedy that comes to many world, worldly Christians. And so last week I, as we opened up this section, we saw uh, one of the six things that the Lord, that Peter wants us to know in order to overcome worldliness. And if you feast on this, if you can understand these things, and by the way, I don't fully understand them. I'm just now beginning to. But as I ponder upon these six truths, I, I think that, and feast on it, you know, the world becomes less and less attractive. And whatever comes, we tell them, we, we, we say, bring it on, it's okay, I'm in good hands. And so we, we saw last week, first of all, the divine recipe to overcome the world, the first point we found, we found was basically everything that Brother Tim has chosen to sing today, and that God loves us. Now that's a very simple thing to say. I can say it right here, you say, okay, move on to the next thing. But this is amazing that God actually loves us. He loves us, He loved us even before we were saved, but now that we are His children, He especially loves us. And this is very important because I need you to remember, and of course, in the context that we find here, you need to understand that these Christians had, many of them had lost everything. Not because they made bad choices, but because they made good choices to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And now they're scattered all over the place. And uh, to get a better understanding of what condition they are in, I would urge you to come with me to 1 Peter, I'm sorry, to Romans chapter 8. And, uh, and look with me at uh, uh, verses 29 through 39. If you get a better idea of what these Christians are going through, I think chapter 8, verse 29 through 39, it really helps us out. So let's read it together. This is Paul writing, and that's quite a few years before Peter writes his epistle. He says, We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose, for whom He did, he did for know. See, so you find that word there as foreknowledge in verse 2. We see what happened because of that foreknowledge. Um, for whom He did for know, He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be first the firstborn among, among many children. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. What shall we then say to these things? If God be with us, who can be against us? You know, when you go back to First Peter, you say, hey folks, don't worry, be happy, God is with you. <clears throat> Who can be against you? But then Paul expands this and he says, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for, uh, for us all, he shall, uh, how shall he not with him also freely uh, uh, give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? See that word there too. We saw that in verse 2. It is God that justified. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also make an intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? 
Shall tribulation? Let's go back to Third Peter. They're going through tremendous tribulation. How about distress? Go back to First Peter. And these Christians are in distress. Or persecution. We go back to First Peter. We see that too. Or famine. Or nakedness. Or peril. Or sword. You go to First Peter. And this is what you find. As it is written, For thy sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Now, if I just read that tonight and said, How many of you would say amen to that? Bring it in, bring it on. How many of you would say, Well, that really encourages me? That's pretty hard language. But notice now this tremendous love that, that we need to believe is special, special love for us. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loveth us. So one of the ingredients that we need to understand that will help us forsake and you know, move away from the worldliness and that will help us go through persecution is this amazing, amazing love. Him that loveth us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor th things present, nor things to come, nor high, nor death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus the, our Lord. One of, the great, one of the great ingredients, I think, that would help us um, go through any kind of situation because if we feast on this we'll be able to say Lord it's okay I know that I'm in good hands and as we saw last week the whole Trinity is involved in this Peter talks about God the Father planning and then he talks about the Holy Spirit performing and then he talks about Jesus Christ purchasing and I have made a whole message on just those three points. How God's Trinity, the Godhead, uh, is all involved in this great work. Now that encourages me because, you know, when you, if you and I would say, hey, let's, let's clean up this room and, and who can I count with? And everybody said, count on me and everybody's here tomorrow morning ready to work, but only one shows up. Then I say, well, you know, that's, I thought everybody was going to be here. Everybody wanted to get involved. And only one or two are here to help help out. You know, in, in this in, in this work, the whole Trinity is there, and all three are saying, "Count on me, count on me, count on me." I want to be part of this great work in your life. So we need to know that we are specially loved. How many of you can say this afternoon? That really helps me out. I wonder those people back in Valencia who lost everything. Some of the brothers that I talked to. I wonder if knowing this will help them pick up all that mud with more enthusiasm. And even encouraging those around them who are lost that also have lost everything. Maybe clean up with a smile on their face saying, Lord, I know I'm still in good hands even though we have experienced this. Now, situations like that we have uh, you know, uh, experienced back in, in Valencia and also in the center of Malaga, in the close to the river Guadalhorte and Guadalmina and all the Cartama area, a lot of places were flooded there. Many had also lost their belongings there. Some, some have even lost their lives. What are the questions that they would raise at the end of the day when they see that they've lost everything? One of the questions I think they would raise would be, uh, where is your God in the middle of tragedy? Where is your God in the middle of tragedy? And as Peter puts it very clearly in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, we need to be ready to give a reasonable answer to that. And I think if we understand these six principles, these six uh, truths that, that Peter presents here, we'll be able, we'll be, we'll, we will be more equipped to answer questions like that. This afternoon, I'm going to make it even harder for you to understand this because notice now the next point know that you are strategically placed when we read verse 1 we see that these believers were strangers who were scattered throughout a large portion of land and then Peter is saying that you know God remember that you have been chosen 
And if we move on to this word chosen, you see it several times in 1 Peter. You noted that this chosen is for a specific purpose, to do something special. And now this is where Peter moves on to say, well, let me tell you what you're there for. And he's, one of the things that we will see is that uh, you're there to share the good news. Now this afternoon we'll be looking at this, this next point, know that you are strategically placed. Now before we move on, I'd like to give you an illustration of how incredible this can be. Have you ever seen in YouTube those videos that kind of looks into the microscope and it shows you the, you know, those things that are in the quantum realm and they're way, way, way into the really fine uh, things in the, you know, in creation. And then moves out, it kind of zooms out, then you see the, the atom and how that works and you see how that atom you know, you, the, it keeps zooming out more and more, then you might see uh, a, a germ, and then that germ, you may keep moving, you know, zooming out, then you see creatures that look more like, science, that, that, that you know, look like they come out of a science fiction movie, but they're real, and the, most of them live in your bed, in your pillow. I've seen how those Things live in a drop of water. Then you, you know, when you, when you get a, water, drop, a, a glass of water from the tap, you think, I wonder how many of those are in this kind of this glass. You see that, you say, whoa, you know, that's, that's, that's amazing. But it keeps zooming out, and then you might have, um, you might just see the hair. Then it moves out, you might see the flesh, and then maybe a whole person. You say, whoa, there I am, that's me. But it keeps zooming out, and then you see that that person becomes very small, and you see the house from the top, and this minute little individual, and zoom, zooms out more, and you see that that house now becomes very, very small in a neighborhood, and that neighborhood becomes even smaller in a city, and that city becomes even smaller in a, in a, in a country, and that country becomes very, very small in, in the planet, and you think, wow, where am I now? And then that planet kind of becomes very, very small, almost like a, a grain of sand, and you see all the other planets, and Earth is very far away, and then it keeps moving on, and you see maybe the Milky Way, and maybe just a squirrel like this, and you say, I'm there somewhere. And, but it keeps moving out, and then you see universes and galaxies, and you see, and, you, and then you go to, you know, and, and you keep seeing that, and you think, where am I? Where, I mean, I, I, everything that I do is way over there. And you feel, how big do you feel? And the interesting thing about the creation is that the Bible tells us is that God holds it in his hand. That's small compared to him. And in that cosmos, they were. Now, when, you, when I say that you are strategically placed, and I paint that picture, you say, well, I guess I don't have a big role in my life. I don't think the Lord wants me to do But if you read verse 1 again, notice what Peter says. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pont and it gives us those five areas. Now, the Bible says that we are strangers. Now some of you live in, in Spain, some of you live here only for a short while during the, the winter. But I would say that if you, if you are a Christian, all of us here are strangers. This world is not our home. Amen? Amen. And the word stranger means sojourner. And he says uh, here that we are strategically placed in this world. Notice the next word, scattered. And what does that mean? Well, first of all, it means that we are scattered as strangers, scattered as people living in a hostile territory. And so Peter is writing to a persecuted people. And again, to help you understand in what condition these uh, Christians were in, we, we, we don't have to guess. We just go to Romans chapter 8. We find the harsh conditions that these Christians were living now, if you do some investigation, if you go into Google and you Google the, what kind of uh, situation the Christians lived in in the first century, you might come across something like I have over here. Um, and this will help you understand the historical context, how all this 
um, began. It says uh, in one of the uh, articles that I found, it says, on July the 16th in the year 64, a madman named Nero burned the city of Rome. He only meant to burn the slums because he wanted to rebuild the slums and he was an egomaniac who wanted to build things for his glory and honor. And in order to get rid of the slums, he set fire to them. And of course the people reacted in ways that he didn't expect them to react and they turned on Nero, the emperor. Now Nero was looking for a scapegoat and so he was looking around for someone to blame and guess who he found to blame. Now he had heard about some of the things that these Christians believed and he, of course he distorted them and it, it could have gone something like that. Uh, you know, how to blame these Christians. Why don't you, you know, I think it's the Christians of fault. This is, these are the guys that you know, destroyed everything. And you know, these Christians are a strange sect. They meet underground. What are they hiding? They have a ceremony that they call the Lord's Supper where they drink blood. <clears throat> Doesn't that make you suspicious? And they also talk about a judgment of fire and twin two together. And it would easy, it'd be easy to say that these people were cannibals who set cities like the city of Rome on fire. And so with something like this going on, it was easy for uh, Nero to say, let's persecute them. They are the bad guys. They're the ones who caused all this destruction. Let's go for them. It's open season for, uh, on the Christians. And I got a good idea. We don't show any mercy. We just... Uh, Put him to shame, we'll nail him on crosses. And many of them were set on fire as human candles to light the, the gardens of Nero and, and for his wild parties and banquets. And many of them were dressed with animal skins and set loose in the forest to be hunted like wild beasts. So when you find these two words, they were scattered as strangers, uh, it gives the idea that God is still in this. And the, the wording <laughs> scattered here is an interesting word. It means to sow through, like uh, sowing a, a, a seed. If you look at the parable of, uh, of the sower in Matthew chapter 13, we get a good idea of how that works. The Lord is the one who is so, sowing the seed, and the seed falls in different kind of ground. Well, this seed fell on this ground, and he gives and he, and I get the idea that it, this was not an accident. That God used this in order to further His purpose of reaching out with the gospel. In Acts chapter eight, verse four, we see this these two words, uh, this word again. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the gospel. That's a wonderful verse. And this now to bring this to a, a practical. Um, to give us some practical, practical understanding. We are in this world not to accumulate in a barn, like he was, as somebody said, we are seed, a seed not to rot in a barn. We are, we are not to rot, we are, uh, or not to rot in the church, not to wither in the church. As Christians, we, we have a business in this world. And listen to me, we have been saved out of this world and we have been set back into the world and we are scattered throughout the world to be witnesses to the world. Going back to the tragedy that took place in, um, in Valencia, I was talking to uh, Alberto, which is a pastor from Elche, which is about an hour and a half away from uh, our brothers in Valencia, talking to Antonio also, he's a pastor in Almeria. Both sent a group over to help out. And their hearts, as I said, were broken. Not just for what they were seeing, but to hear the stories. Many have lost their lives, many have lost their loved ones. And so they think, okay, we're here now to help out clean the mud kind of bring some restoration. 
But if you talk to uh, these brothers now, they think uh, we have something else that we're here for. We are here to bring some kind of hope to the people that have lost everything. I just wonder, I'm not saying that this is what God is intending, but I just wonder the Lord allowed this to happen. It's not the, the artifice, it's not the one creating this situation, but I just wonder if the Lord, in His, um, in his, his I don't know, in His mercy, He just thought, maybe if I can just wake these people up. Nothing better than tragedy to help us to, uh, evaluate or value the real thing, the thing that really matter. <clears throat> Brother Coloma wrote me a note saying, you know, we had lost that refrigerator, we saved a lot. So we, we always wanted a double door refrigerator. Many years we say we finally got one and now it's destroyed. Washing machine is gone. All their appliances are gone. My youngest son was getting is getting married and of course he doesn't have any furniture, he's living with us now. And we had a couch, a very nice couch that we were saving for them in the garage. That's destroyed. Everything in the basement was destroyed. Their car was floating in the garage, as he said to me, to, uh, underwater. You know, you hear these things and, and you think, well, where is God in all this? But then that's not the end of the story. Then he says, you know, we put so much effort into the material things. We work hard, we try to save, we try to be good administrators of the uh, things that God gives us. We put so much, give so much importance to that. But when we lose it all, then we know what really is important. Says we're getting to know the neighbors better than, uh, than ever before. <clears throat> we're able to open up to people who are really, really hurting. Before they had no interest. Now they, they hold on to anything that gives them hope. I've talked to Brother Samuel and Brother Javier Coloma's son, who is now pastoring the church. He says, I get up early in the morning and I work hard with uh, several of my family, my wife, try to encourage some of the neighbors to get out with buckets and try to clean up until seven, eight o'clock at night, all day long. When I go home, I'm full of mud. All I want to do is get a shower, get some rest, so that tomorrow we start again. Very, very sad story. And if, if that was the end of the story, you would say, you know what? Yeah, where is God in all this? But then they end up saying, you know, you know, this has helped me understand that the more we put our values on the things of this world, the more empty we will feel at the end when we lose it all. Now these individuals that we find here, they were scattered as strangers. They, 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 uh, <clears throat> and not only scattered as, as strangers, they were scattered as seed, and then they were scattered as saints. If you look with me in verse 2, it says sanctified uh, through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience. So they were the sanctified ones. And they were there to make a difference. And folks, let me tell you something. If we don't live in a Christ-like way, we won't, be, we won't make a difference where we live. Mm -hmm. All we will be doing all day long, seven days a week, throughout the month, throughout the year, will be just working hard, trying to make sense out of the whole thing. Let's just get a bigger house. Let's just find a better location. Let me, let's just get a better car. Maybe we'll just accumulate more things. Maybe I'll... Maybe I'll be satisfied. If that's what you're looking for, for satisfaction, you'll never be satisfied. If you don't believe me, just read Ecclesiastes. What does Paul, what does Solomon say with all the things he had accumulated? At the end of the day, he's sitting <laughs> on his bed thinking, been there, done that, uh, now what? At the end of the day, he was saying, all of his vanity, vanity of vanity, all is vanity and affliction of spirit. Everything's empty without, and you know, God meant it that way so that, you know, life would be meaningless unless we put him in the center. And he moves on through the, through the book of Ecclesiastes all the way to the last chapter when he says, pay attention. It's almost like a desperate call to the future generation saying, 
God is still in heaven and he's going to judge. And he talks to young people saying, make sure you make wise decisions. Enjoy your, your youth. Enjoy the things that, that come your way. But remember, one day you're going to have to be given accountability. You have to give an account to the things that you do. And so when we look at this passage and you think that we are strategically uh, placed, it, it, it kind of makes me wonder, you know, leave this little me strategically placed to do what? And if you keep reading the, the epistle, then he, Peter says, let me tell you what. <coughs> and remember this, this is, Peter has, Peter has one more epistle that he's going to write, which is second, second Peter. And there is second Peter, he says, uh, my time is, 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 my time is gone. So it's not just somebody who is uh, sitting in the Bahamas under, uh, pine, uh, yeah, under a pine tree enjoying uh, the view and a uh, nice piña colada, whatever it is that you like when you're under a pine tree, a pine tree, a palm tree. <laughs> yeah, it's not that condition that he's writing in. He's saying, you know, I am ready to be offered. And I'm okay with it. Just like Paul when he writes Second uh, Timothy, he says, I, my time is finished, but you know, I'm satisfied because I've run a good race. I've fought the fight. I'm ready to go home. How many of you this afternoon are ready to go to heaven? If you're saved this afternoon, how many of you would say, I'm happy with that? Let me let that sink in. You start feeling tomorrow morning, you start feeling kind of uh, strange, and you think, honey, I don't, there's something uh, over here that I don't know where it is. I, it wasn't there yesterday, but today, I've, then in the afternoon it gets more, more severe, and you say, well, maybe you need to go to the emergency room. Nah, you know how men are, and they don't go, but you know, you, the wife convinces them that maybe something serious, and you go to the emergency room and say, well, you need to do some x-ray, you need to check this out. This. And he looks, you know, gives you that look. Uh, this is not for something you can play with. This can cost you your life. And then that's when you, you say, whoa. And you do all the tests and you bring those tests brought before the, the, the doctor. And he says, are you ready for the news? Okay, give me the, good, uh, the bad news first. There's only bad news. There's no bad news and good news. The bad news is that you have... Just a few weeks of life. Would you repeat that again? Yeah, you are, if it uses a biblical language, you're ready to be offered. You're ready to. Um, are you ready for death? How would you react to that? Getting something like you know, getting something like that, uh, news that of that kind, that would you say, "Oh, what am I going to do with my car now? What am I going to do with my beautiful home that I've saved so much and have dedicated so much time to decorate?" Those that I mean, I've I've, I've gone through, I've done so much shopping to have my favorite clothes in the closet there, and. You know, I don't want to show you my bank account, but you know, you would, you would kill to know what's in my bank account. I've been able to say, you know, I'm in a wonderful, I'm not ready to die. Whether you're ready or not, you look, you're going to die in just a matter of time. You, you see what I'm talking about? I mean, these Christians were in a situation where they, they didn't have tomorrow guaranteed. As, Peter, as Paul puts it in Romans chapter 8, it says, we are being killed all the time. It's, it's just a matter for you. It would be a matter of just somebody ringing. Oh, I wonder who it is now. Oh, do you know brother so-and-so? They went into his home and they, they, they killed him. They, somebody, uh, you know, uh, gave news that they were Christians. And you know how they are against Christians. And they went into brother so-and-so's house and they killed them both, all the family. <gasps> really? And you think, well, I wonder when my time will come in. Just a few minutes later, the, the phone rings again, and you have another call. Uh, oh, by the way, uh, the Brown, nobody Brown here by the name of Brown or Smith. You know, the Browns uh, just called. They found the husband witnessing to somebody, and they, t uh, they told him, and uh, 
Now it's in, in jail. We don't know if it's just going to simply disappear or if they're just going to bring the body and lay it in the front door as a warning. A few minutes later, you get another phone call. I wonder who it's, it's going to be now. But then instead of the phone call, you get a knock at the door. And you look through the peephole there and you find that it's you now. I want to try to make this as crude as possible only to wake us up because we, John, uh, Tim said it very well, we are enjoying tremendous liberty. We have opportunities to share the gospel and we don't use them. We are so busy with all those things that worry us. And the last thing that we do, and the thing that we normally do is lay this witnessing stuff for another day. I know that my neighbor needs it. I know that uh, this friend that I made yesterday needs it too. But, you know, if I tell them about this gospel, it, 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 I'm, gonna lose, I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to have any friends left. See where I'm going with this? And so, when we look at this uh, next point, you are strategically a, a planter or place. It means that God has a purpose for you. And whether it's in this kind of environment or in a, an environment where you're going to be persecuted, God has placed us to be witnesses. Peter moves on telling us that of the privileges that we have. And he moves all the way to chapter, uh, chapter 2. Again, we read the, this last time, verse 9, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Oh, that, you know what that means? I'm going to live in the palace. A peculiar people. And as I look from here, I think, whoa, this is really a peculiar group. Just look at Brother Tim. He's a peculiar man. I'm only kidding. But it, what it means here, you are our special people. And notice what we are, how we are strategically placed and what we are to do now that we are planted in this place, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into this marvelous light. Before we were not part of the family of God, but if you have trusted Christ and received him as your personal savior, you can rejoice with unspeakable joy because now you have something reserved for you in heaven, which God himself is keeping for you. We'll get to that point later on. We are here planted specifically in a very hostile environment, and we are strategically located, and God says, go and preach the gospel to every creature, teaching them to obey all things. Now, how many of us We'll leave this building and say, well, you know, I went to church this afternoon. Hopefully, you know, I had a really bad week. Uh, the food burnt twice. I was ironing the shirt, my husband's shirt. It's the best shirt he had. I burned it. I was hoping I would get some comfort. And then you pass the preaching on this. I'm going to leave very, in a very, very um, unsettled way. Well, that's what you take from this message. You didn't get the point. Because the idea here is that we are not only um, strategically placed, but we are blessed by this. It's a blessing. Now, if you are strategically placed in the coast of the soul, you say amen to that. But imagine being strategically placed in a situation like this, these first Christians uh, were in. You would wonder, uh, I wonder really, first point, if I'm really loved by God, it doesn't seem like I am because it, it seems like he has forgotten us. Look, what, look at the conditions we're living in. And again, not for doing bad, but because we're doing the right thing. We're being witnesses of the Lord Jesus Christ. Does really God really love us? And then why end up in this? Have you ever seen Cappadocia? Brother Tim, you've been there, haven't you? No. When we went to Cappadocia, I said, I wonder if uh, the Lord would send us here as missionaries and we would be happy. <laughs> I looked around and there wasn't anything green. I said, my, well, my wife would be happy. She's allergic to green. <laughs> Some things, sometimes I think she's allergic to me. <laughs> you know, you think, you know, how would, be, how would, it, would it be to say, okay, I'm just going to refuge in this place. And if you, if you snow Cappadocia, this is just the, 
there's nothing there but bushes and and nothing. There's I mean just a strange form that nature has created and nothing. And now you say, well, this is gonna be our home, and what are we gonna be what what how did we end here? How did we end up in this place? And the Lord says, you have been elected to go there and preach the gospel. Now, let me, again, I'm, I'm, I'm rambling right here, but I, do, I want to bring this to a close. When I told my wife, and now, now that nobody's listening, when I told my wife the Lord had called me to be a missionary, he says, good luck, I'll pray for you. Believe me, she said that. Knowing Maritza, you know that she has double intentions. But then she said, where to? I said, Andalusia. She said, I'll go with you. If I would have said Russia, or even Cappadocia, or China, or one of these Muslim countries, how do you think she would have felt? Uh, I don't want to ask you that question. But you know, when it's a nice place, we say, I want to do God's will. But what about it's a bad place? If it's not a nice place, John, you might remember we had a team from uh, uh, a little town in Germany about an hour away from Frankfurt. Brother Munson brought nine people from his church. Mm -hmm. Or was it 19? I think it was more like 19. Every year they did a mission trip. And one year, um, that year, Brother Munson called the church and said, well, it's a uh, plan for this mission trip for the church this year. And I thought about Romania. Any volunteer, if any, anyone volunteer to go to